So, um, um, as uh, Darion mentioned, I'm Stefan Verholst. I'm the uh, co-founder of uh, GovLab or Governance Laboratory. And so we are an action research center based here in New York. Uh, we are actually part of the engineering school of New York University. And our mission is to transform the way we make decisions in society, leveraging new technologies and new tools. And specifically, what that has meant is that we have focused on what we believe are two important assets in society that we can leverage in new ways to inform the decisions that, uh, uh, anyway, impact people's lives. And uh, those two assets are on the one hand, people. So we do a lot of work around leveraging the expertise that people have across society in new ways. And quite often we call that our work around collective intelligence and trying to identify who actually knows what uh, uh, and how do we connect that with the decision cycle. And as we all know, we actually do have to do a lot better work in that space because everyone has something to contribute, but quite often never get asked to actually share what they know and how that could make a difference in how people and society solves problems. The other asset, and surprise, surprise, that's why Darian, I guess, invited me today, is of course data. And here we've done a lot of work on how do we leverage data in new and innovative ways to transform the way we go about making decision-making in society. And here we've done a lot of work on initially focusing on opening up data, but also we've been done doing a lot of work on actually how do we make sure that data informs the decision-making process uh, in a way that it improves the way we go about uh, making decisions that uh, impacts uh, uh, people's lives. And so within that context, I will speak uh, mainly about our experiences, about the potential of data, and then subsequently, of course, the potential of data visualization, which is, of course, the manifestation on the insight that is being generated from leveraging the data, because data obviously has no value without actually uh, generating insight that matters. And that's my first uh, point is that we have seen, and anyway, and I think Stephanie had a, this was just a, a random selection, so don't feel any uh, uh, any ranking here, but uh, clearly we've seen a lot of advances in how the insight of data has been visualized and whether it's three-dimensional, whether it's anyway, using different kinds of color coding and different ways of uh, uh, going about making the insight more um, shareable and also, um, anyway, really identifying what is the nugget of insight that one needs to uh, know. The question that we have started posing more and more is that it's great to have wonderful data visualizations, but does the insight actually matter? Is it the right insight that we need to share, or is it just the insight that we managed to get because of the data that happened to be available? And uh, what we try to do is to try to turn the, the paradigm a little bit by saying, yeah, it's great to have wonderful data visualizations and it's great to have, anyway, data uh, insights, but let's go a step further and actually really focus on, are these actually the answers that matter to the questions that matter? Because what we see a lot in the data space and also in the data visualization space is the example that is uh, presented here is that we quite often look under the lamppost for our keys because that happens to be the place where the light is shining. And what we are trying to challenge is, is that actually the right place for looking for the insight, right? Are these the right kinds of questions that we as a society need to answer, right? Because too often we just look where the data is available as opposed to what are actually the questions that matter for which we need data and then subsequently data visualizations. The other challenge with um, not having a question-led uh, or problem-led uh, approach is that actually it gets us into problems. And uh, we do a lot of work around data governance. And it turns out one of the biggest challenges of data governance is the fact that we don't really think about the questions that we need to answer. We just start with data and as a result, generate more data and collect more data just because we can uh, generate and collect data, not because the data is what we need for the questions that matter, right? And again, uh, that generates massive problems with regard to data governance. And if we would be much smarter 
about really thinking through and prioritizing the questions that we seek to answer, we would also prioritize data collection and as a result have less perhaps uh, challenges with regard to the uh, surveillance that is quite often uh, happening as well. And so what we try to do is basically go back to what apparently Albert Einstein said, and of course, as you know, <laughs> I think Albert Einstein said everything smart in the universe. And the question is, did he actually really say that? But apparently Albert Einstein indicated that if I had an hour to solve the problem, right? I would spend fi 55 minutes really thinking about the problem, right? And defining it. And then five minutes thinking about the solution because it would emerge automatically. And I think the same uh, uh, approach we have tried to adopt within the data space where we say, well, instead of anyway, jumping on the data as a solution, let's take a step back and really thinking about what is the problem? What is the question that we seek to answer? And how do we go about this? And so that's where we have been advocating that if we make advances in data science, we actually need to complement data science, question science. We need a new science of questioning, a new way of actually formulating questions that matter in society that can be answered by data, but not jump automatically on the data bandwagon. Now, clearly, I do have to acknowledge that quite often, anyway, data can help us formulate the questions, right? It's not like an either or, right? But at the same time, we do need to be more uh, intentional in really defining the questions and really thinking about what do we mean by the questions that matter and who determines, by the way, what are the questions that matter? I mean, there's a lot of discussion about data equity. What we try to advance is also questions equity, i.e. who actually is part of the process in formulating the questions, because that determines also what are the answers that we as a society ultimately have. And so, the initiative that we've launched is called the 100 questions in order to road test our new kind of methodology of formulating questions. And it's based upon, anyway, a previous set of previous talks uh, that I've given in the past, where I argued that it's great to have 100 data sets. What I really would like are 100 questions. And then we can actually identify what are the data sets that matter to answer those questions as well. And so what we try to do here is to really go into a variety of areas and engage with a broader community to, for instance, identify what are the questions that matter with regard to migration for which we actually do need the answers in order to then inform the decisions that can improve the lives of migrants or the way we actually deal with migration. And of course, uh, we have seen recent uh, uh, trends and recent actions that uh, those kinds of challenges are only more important to focus on. Same for gender, air quality, future of work, food. Um, we've done uh, 100 questions initiatives around uh, uh, other topic areas, uh, such as, for instance, governance in itself, but also disinformation. And uh, we just uh, launched another one around urban mobility as well. And the idea is to ultimately anyway, have 10 domains, 10 questions in each domain, and that obviously would be the 100 questions that we then as a society can start working and seeking ways to start answering them as opposed to massive fragmentation of questions that uh, and massive fragmentations of data that ultimately doesn't add up. Now, how do we go about this? Very briefly, because I wanna focus on two key elements, especially for this audience that is interested in visualization and thinking of ways to actually uh, also disseminate a better way of the questions and what are the questions. But typically we have a few uh, areas that uh, we focus on. And so before we go and uh, engage with the broader community about formulating the questions, we first try to develop a map of what is the topic at hand. What are all the issues associated with a particular kind of topic, a particular kind of problem? Because quite often we are anyway thinking about a problem and then we only focus on one aspect of the problem because that happens to be the aspect that those that formulate the question knows most about. And so what we try to do here is to actually have a broader perspective, right? Of what are all the topics, right? A kind of, anyway, it's not a system maps per se, but it's more of a topic map, right? What are all the topics that are associated 
with a particular kind of problem that we need to at least be aware of so that we then can know what are the kinds of topics that are ignored and what are the kinds of questions that we need to formulate. Now, in addition to that, we then develop a cohort of what we call the new bilinguals, people that are um, experts in a particular kind of domain, but also uh, have a certain kind of data uh, expertise, because the key element here and the key question that we try to uh, uh, answer is, who are super questioners, right? Who are the individuals in society that actually know what should be the kinds of questions to get us started, right? And, uh, and it's based upon some of our work in crowdsourcing uh, and forecasting, because as you know, um, uh, there is also a, a whole literature there about the fact that there are some super forecasters that can really help us identify uh, uh, what, what, what might happen in the future. What we try to do here is that identify super questioners, uh, which are people that have a certain kind of expertise in the domain, but also uh, expertise as it relates to what data can do. We then source them using a taxonomy of questions, uh, because uh, again, too often we assume that all questions uh, can be answered by data, and quite often we assume that all questions are, have equal value. And I think we do need to develop a better taxonomy of understanding what are the kinds of questions, and then also what are the kinds of answers and analytics for that matter that we need. And then subsequently we have then a process, actually a public voting, uh, initiative where we then prioritize the questions. We go back to the public and says, look, these are the questions that anyway our bilinguals have formulated, which ones resonate and how do we upvote some of those questions so that we not only rely on the experts, but also have a more broader public conversation actually about what are the questions that matter as it relates to gender? What are the questions that matter as it relates to migrants? What are the questions that matter as it relates to food and sustainability and so on. And, um, and that's then uh, our public uh, consultation. And then lastly, of course, we are not only interested in formulating questions, we then actually seek ways to answer those questions by bringing different data holders to the table because it turns out that in order to answer those questions, we actually need to be far more innovative in what kinds of data can actually help answering those questions and we need to do this in a more collaborative fashion. Anyway, I have a much longer presentation about all of those topics, but I do want to focus on two uh, very quickly aspects that I feel, and that's my call, the data and design uh, community can help us do much better. And the first one is about topic mapping. And quite often I compare topic mapping as building the gestalt of a particular kind of problem, right? So that you actually know, right, if you talk about a problem, these are the elements, right? That are associated with the problem and you have a clear understanding that that is the whole of the problem. And I think uh, what we try to do here is to really build gestalts of problem fields, right? Based upon the work of, anyway, Max Wertheimer and of course others in the design community that have tried to, anyway, use gestalt as a design uh, theory as well in order to see things as a whole. And that, of course, anyway, involves a certain set of principles such as, anyway, the laws of organization on what topic is closer to each other, how do we cluster them, right? What are similarities? And how do we then make sure that we don't make it overly complex? Because surprise, surprise, uh, society is complex. And if you do anyway a topic mapping, you can quickly actually get lost into the detail. And so that's what we've been trying to do. And as you can see, we need your help because this is one of our topic mappings that we, for instance, have developed around cycles of disadvantage as it relates to justice reinvestment, i.e. how do we break, for instance, the fact that those that leave prison, get back into prison in a short period of time? And what are all the variables of the problem of, for instance, justice reinvestment? And so here, anyway, we've identified uh, four big clusters. Uh, we then uh, anyway, identified subtopics, and then we tagged the different kinds of subtopics using a particular kind of tagging system as well in order to connect and create those uh, um, relationships. I could send and give you a lot more examples, but my call to the community today is that help us find a way to visualize 
those gestalts better, right? Uh, because we don't, we haven't seen that many good approaches uh, to actually doing those kinds of uh, topic mappings. I mean, what we've seen is that quite often we have visual metaphors to build those type of topic mappings, which I think is clearly a, an advance in how you um, bring uh, complex areas to the table. Uh, but we also have seen, anyway, and this is a picture of an exhibit I uh, attended two weeks ago here in New York. If you're in New York, uh, highly recommended at the Pace Gallery, where David Byrne uh, is uh, anyway showcasing some of uh, uh, his uh, latest uh, um, drawings, which are actually kind of topic mapping drawings, right, uh, that uh, really bring complex issues uh, to the table. And I think we need a lot more of those kinds of topic mappings as well. These are the typical topic mappings that we build, which is anyway, quite interactive, right? You can hoover over them and then you see the relationships, but we do need a lot more uh, work. And again, I would love to uh, actually work with Stephanie on uh, how do we make those topic mappings indeed more interactive, but also uh, more meaningful in a way uh, including, for instance, topic graphs, and we've seen a lot of advances with regard to topic graphs where we can actually connect all those deaths as well. But we also need more immersive topic maps because that's the other area that I do a lot more work on, especially if we want, want to inform decision-making. What's the decision theater in which we want to basically present those topic mappings, right? And how do we actually see it more as a theatrical experience where you have different kinds of uh, uh, elements being presented that can inform how you go about, uh, for instance, a decision making. And I think that's where we need a lot more work. Uh, out. Anyway, once we have a topic mapping, uh, and we quite often, of course, use the topic mapping as a way to not get lost in the forest uh, or just focus on the trees, um, but you can use it for a variety of purposes, including then identifying who are the actors across those topic mappings that uh, are actually working on the issues, right? So we have a better way to do actor mapping and to understand who is who in the space. We have a better way to also know what is known about a particular kind of topic. We have a better way to engage a broader community about, anyway, what is it that uh, um, uh, you care more about vis-a-vis -vis other aspects and what are the variables that determine certain kinds of prioritization as well. And it allows us also, as I said, to be more responsible with regard to data and the use of artificial intelligence, because we actually know now what are the elements that we want to have. The other element that I briefly want to say is that uh, we also developed this taxonomy of questions uh, in order to then, if you have a topic mapping, what are the questions that you need to, or what are the questions that we would like to have? And it ranges from questions with regard to situational awareness, right? So the typical descriptive kind of questions, i.e. what is the current state of that problem, for instance, to more cause and effect kind of diagnostic questions saying that, okay, we know the state of the problem, but why are we in the current state of the problem? And what are some of the variables to then ultimately prediction and simulation to ultimately impact assessment? And so we have a whole uh, way to then uh, understand also from a data visualization point of view, how those different types of questions can be visualized because they require a different kind of visualization depending on the question. So let me end with uh, some quotes. And again, those quotes are from a different era, as you can see in the use of the term man here, which I, I always am kind of uh, careful to <laughs> emphasize that this was clearly from a previous era, but obviously Voltaire anyway had said at set occasions that judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. And I think that's also something that we may want to have to take into account moving forward when we talk about data, especially. And of course, Mahfouz has also claimed that you can tell whether a man is clever by his answers, but you can tell whether a man is wise by his questions. And so I tried to use those two quotes uh, and uh, adjust them to this community by saying this, that you can judge a data visualization by the questions it seeks to answer, because it's really about what are the questions that matter. And you can tell whether a data presentation is clever by its answers, but a data presentation is wise if it starts with a topic mapping to then position the questions and the answers in which they were formulated. So with that, uh, let me stop here, um, uh, Darian. And again, as I hope, this was meant to be more of a provocation and, uh, and a start of a conversation, as Stephanie also was alluding to, 
because I think data is the start of a conversation. Questions can also be the start of the conversation moving forward.